Hello and welcome to episode 9 of Mountain Mindset. My name is Andre Manzouk. I'm a mental performance coach, professor of sports science, and the founder of MZK Performance. This week I'm joined by Pete Whittaker. Pete's a long-time professional climber, having put up first ascents around the world, sent countless hard single-pitch trad lines, and recently climbed big walls in both Europe and North America. During our conversation, Pete and I chat about the importance of being prepared, how he quantifies risk in outdoor environments, and why he believes that confidence is built upon the bank of his previous experiences. On that note, let's dive into our conversation. Pete, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Cheers. So kick us off here, Pete. Introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, so I am Pete Whitaker, and I guess you could call me a professional rock climber, but I, I guess the uh, the position of a professional rock climber comes under many different things. I mean, I also have a uh, the Wide Boys business, uh, so doing all things to do with crack climbing, and then also within the under the sort of professional climber bracket, I also do speaking. Uh, I've written a book about crack climbing. Um, yeah, and then I obviously work with my my sponsors and my brands who support me and, and my climbing. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of that's who I am. That's what I do. Uh, yeah, I, I come from the UK. Grew up in England. Come from the Peak District. Yeah, that's a very brief introduction. Really, a jack of all trades when it comes to the professional side of climbing. I, I guess you just like you end up getting into these things and just picking things up along the way. You know, like when I was fourteen, fifteen, sixteen at school, I would have never imagined myself to be presenting in front of like you know, like an audience, or I certainly wouldn't have thought myself of writing a, a book, for example. Um, and also like it, even um, sort of managing my own business and stuff, you know, I just, I didn't really think, I didn't really know where I was going to go there. You just like, you end up going down these paths and then you, you, yeah, you kind of basically go with it and work with what you've got and what you know, and learn things along the way, pretty much. Yeah, that sounds so serendipitous and uh, really just a case of kind of following your passion and a lot of different challenges from hard head pointing, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, 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 no, definitely. Um, there's, I think with, uh, I mean, I, I would say I kind of started um, like, if, if, if we take like sort of like difficult climbing and then my work side of things, I probably like started hard climbing before all these work things that I've just mentioned but I think there's definite like crossover that you can take from both of them you know things that you can actually learn from doing hard head pointing for example or hard on sighting and actually like transfer it over to the other things that you have in life going on I think yeah I'm curious what are some of those key transferable skills that you mentioned uh the transferable skills I, I think um sort of definitely like having a uh a like end goal and a, a focus um and sometimes things so if you have like a, a hard head point as an end goal and it can seem kind of it can seem like quite a risky thing to do it when you start trying that that route uh but then it's just like making the little building blocks to be able to get you to the point where that thing feels comfortable and achievable and you're able to do it. And I think, well, that's certainly one thing that you can transfer over to something within like the white boys business, for example, you know, when you're coming up with ideas for a new product or something that you, you know, like this far fetched idea that you're going to like create this thing and then try and get it to an audience. It can seem like way not really achievable because you don't have the contacts and you don't know where to start and where to go but you just kind of have these building blocks and you're just like okay well i'll just do this first and then see where that takes me and then i'll just design this little bit and then i'll make this next contact and then yeah it kind of like it's just like a little path and i think that's i've taken that from both sides from you know hard head pointing red pointing whatever it might be 
um, and just making the little steps to be able to get you to the end goal. Uh, Is yeah. there a particular way that you like to visualize that? So for context, I was presenting at a, a workshop a few years ago and I was collaborating on it with Mina Leslie Viastic at the Arcteryx Climbing Academy in Squamish. And she was mm. saying she follows a similar process and likes to visualize it as a series of steps almost. So you just go up each stair in the staircase and every step is obviously one from the one before it. Is, is there a way similar to that that you like to look at it? That's a, that's a good way of putting it. I mean, I definitely don't visualize it like that. Um, I don't really, I'm not really sure I have a way of visualizing it like you've just described, I don't think. Um, I, I think I'm more of a person who sort of, has in a way yeah in kind of a boring way i'm more of like a list person so <laughs> you know i generally just like write things down and have a things that i want to achieve by a certain point or a certain date um and that can like i say that can both be within climbing and uh within like these work things um and be in training actually as well so even if it was just like okay by this date i want to be able to do this many second hang off this edge or whatever it might be, you know, something daft like that. Um, I, yeah, I don't really have a visual thing. It's, I guess it is a visual thing in terms of writing it down, but I don't imagine it as a staircase. I've never imagined it like that. And you <laughs> that's right. a good way of putting it, I think. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I think it speaks to the individual differences between people. You write those down as a physical list? Uh, I generally do, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and sometimes it would just be, I think for like climbing things, it's usually, uh, I usually do it at the start of each year and have a thing for each, each year. And I sort of have uh, big goals, which could be um, not even achievable within that year, uh, but they're just things that go on the list kind of each year. And maybe I'll pick off one or maybe I won't pick off any. Uh, and then I'll have like uh, semi big goals um, and they'll be the ones that, yes, hopefully I'll be able to achieve this year. And then I'll have like the smaller ones, which will be leading to the, you know, the semi big goals or the big goals. And they'll, you know, you'll be able to achieve those within the month, within, a, you know, the season or whatever it might be. Uh, and I generally write those down. Yeah. Like physically write them down, like you know, on a Word document on my laptop. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just go through and highlight them at the end of the season or as you go, as you take them off. Yeah, although, although I don't, yeah, generally I just like delete them as I do them or I have them on my phone or, or whatever they are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we know a lot about you. I'm sure a lot of our audience know a lot about you as a climber and, a, and as a business owner. Um, but what's something that we might not know about you? Oh, something you might not know. Uh... Or just like like anything anything <laughs> anything at all <laughs> um uh, i can ride a unicycle <laughs> what's the what's the story there tell us tell us pete um basically i just got one uh one year for my birthday when i was quite young and i guess i'm the sort of person who you know when you get something like that you, you try it until you can do it you know I, like I don't want to put it down and it was yeah it was just like I didn't want to put it down until I'd done it there was a lot of falling off obviously of course um but yeah I got to the point where I can ride it so I can still ride a unicycle now <laughs> yeah yeah very random that but that was just what the, that's the first thing that came to my head because it's it is a bit bizarre yeah how often do you check in these days that you can still ride it is it a case of like every time you go back to your folks place you you pick it up and give it a go uh, it's it's in uh, it's actually at my house in my shed outside, but the tire is flat and uh, like I, yeah, I, I haven't ridden it properly for years. But occasionally, I'll just get on it on a flat tire and just double check that I can still sit on it and ride around, which I can. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that with us. <laughs> yeah. When you think about your climbing career over the years, obviously it's gone through so many phases and so many objectives uh, and various successes, but are there any real standout moments that, that you'd like to recall? Mm, oh, there's definitely like, there are definitely standout moments. I mean, really, I guess the kind of the, 
the kind of the obvious ones, like um, like the kind of big off thing trip that me and Tom did in 2011 to America. Uh, I mean, I was only 20 at the time, and it was the first. It was the first. I think it was the first time I'd been out of Europe actually on on a climbing trip, um, and yeah, it was just like you know we'd put that massive amount of training in and. Uh, and the trip went really well and yeah for sure that was definitely like it it wasn't it wasn't a particular standout moment but it was a standout trip um and I th- I, even though i've done lots of other things uh since then it's funny because obviously people still remember that trip over many of the other things that i've done prior to that even though they they the things prior to that may be more difficult or you know that kind of stuff um so so definitely that and then um i think some of the in more recent years maybe some of the the kind of solo things that i've done um so that's been a mixture of like free soloing things and rope soloing things um uh, some things in norway actually and some things in yosemite um yeah i think they like both those two things that that trip in 2011 and more the the solo adventures are the things that stand out to me personally i think yeah so i've got questions actually one for for each of those standout moments and my first one's about the uh, big us trip in your your early 20s kind of maybe earlier on in your adult section of your climbing career and i'm curious what made that trip stand out stand out so much for you uh i th- i think it was it was first because it was probably one of my first big trips away. Uh, and secondly, it was like the whole build up to that trip um, in the sense that me and Tom had had this massive end goal, uh, which we'd kind of put out there. And we'd sort of thought of this goal two years prior to even going to the States. Um, and two years prior, we were nowhere near capable of being able to climb this route that we wanted to do on that trip um and i think it was the whole build up to that and the training uh and kind of like the sacrifices that we put into those two years um that made that trip so special in a way uh and i think it was also doing it with like uh your climbing partner and your best friend and somebody like that and kind of building up that relationship together and i think that was pretty like a a, a standout thing about it as well because after that trip obviously me and tom have been friends for the next 10 years and climbed together for the next 10 years so i think that's quite stand out and yeah special in a way as well that must have been such a validating experience to have that hard work kind of um come to fruition and that vision come true having put the work in over like a consistent time period i'm sure that's something that's stuck with you since then yeah no definitely and i think it's made me uh realize that if you do put the hard work in then things will happen (laughs) you know i mean i don't think everything is ever you know it's not always going to be as successful as that trip i mean i think there was a large amount of effort that went into that and probably like some luck as well i think to have these like big things there's definitely a mixture of both i think things have got to align uh so i think definitely if you put the hard work into something then it might not come on the first attempt it might not come on the second attempt but if you like if you keep going away at it at some point that hard work and that look will align uh and the hard work will pay off that's what i always think uh yeah that's a question was there i'm not sure no that's perfect that's a really interesting way to conceptualize it um i think over the previous couple of years in sports psych we've been thinking less about you know, getting lucky on a low percentage move and more about creating opportunities that you'll do it if you give it X amount of goes and if your preparation is, you know, this, um, that well thought out and it sounds like it aligns with how you plan that, plan that trip. Yeah, 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 no, definitely. I think so. Yeah. Uh, and then my second question was, was about the soloing, obviously free soloing and rope soloing require very different skill sets from a technical, psychological, physical standpoint and but what is it that maybe attracted you to that style of climbing? Um, I guess in terms of um, free solo climbing, I've always been 
I, I guess you could say I've always been into that style of climbing anyway, from quite a young age. They've never been like massive rocks or anything, but I've, because I grew up in the Peak District, um, we have like access to lots of little small crags and they actually lend themselves to uh, doing lots of routes, uh, but without a rope, because you can just get lots of mileage and you can go up and down, up and down, up and down and get lots of climbing in. And from probably from like the age of mm, 15, I think I was doing a lot of that stuff. Um, so I've always sort of been into that. Uh, I just never really done it on much of a big scale. You know, these routes are maximum 20 meters, I guess. So it's not really like, yeah, it's not really like big wall free soloing, for, for example. Um, so I've always been into that. And then the rope soloing, that, to be honest, I didn't know anything about rope soloing until uh, 2016. So it was 2016 when I decided that I want to go and climb El Cap by myself. Uh, and I didn't actually know how to do that. Uh, and then I sort of like read up on it and on how to like climb by yourself. And there was this technique called rope soloing. And then I read up on it. I went and practiced it. And uh, that's when I started like, yeah, trying rope soloing. So that's where that came about. Yeah. So for the, I have a large base of listeners in Squamish and Vancouver. And for those who are listening, maybe over this side of the water, um, the crags Pete's talking about are really similar to smoke bluffs that we have over here yes, in terms yeah, of, very similar. you know, 10 to 20 meter outcrops that you can go up one route and then nip down something that's maybe a wee bit easier uh, and kind of repeat that along the along the outcrop. Yeah, that's a great example. I've climbed in smoke bluffs, so yeah. <laughs> so what about challenges along the way? Um, I mean, we've talked a little bit about some successes, some things that have gone really well. Is there anything that has been kind of challenging or something you've over had to overcome? Uh, and then my second part of that question is what have you learned from that going forwards? Um, I mean, there's, there's definitely always... Uh... There's definitely always challenges. Um, it's oh, what? I, it's it's hard to actually like pinpoint an actual um, challenge. I feel, to be honest, I really feel like I'm the sort of person who just like gets on with stuff, and so it it might not when things occur or challenges occur, they might not. Or like problems occur for example it, it in some ways it doesn't necessarily seem like a problem <laughs> it's just some it's just something that i have to overcome i can't really think of any like major difficulties um i mean uh, up until a few months ago i'd, I'd also actually never really had a, a proper injury as well you know I, i'd actually been quite lucky because i mean that's definitely a, a problem that a lot of people have to have to overcome um like injuries and stuff uh, yeah and up until a few months ago i'd never had a, a proper injury but then i did injure myself but again like it, i just sort of when that did happen i just was a little bit like a little bit down for a day or two and then i just thought thought oh well i'll just work on stuff that I'm not necessarily that good at or pick out the bits that aren't going to affect that injury and work on different things. Um, and then hopefully when the injury finally recovers, I'll come back a little bit stronger. <laughs> yeah. It seems like you approach stuff in a very like procedural way. And I think we can link that back to your previous statement about learning how to rope solo. Um, and, and maybe you want to expand a little bit more on what that maybe not a technicality is a learning process, but what kind of steps do you have to go through when you're taking on and, you know, a new and unknown challenge like that? Yeah, I, I definitely am like, um, I'm quite, what's the word? Uh, particular or, oh, what's the word? I can't think of the, the exact word that we're looking for here. Um, oh, I can't think of the word. But well, I, I am quite particular and focused on something so i will give like attention to detail like i want things to be right uh, and i want things to be like you know run smoothly so i think that that definitely stands out with like the rope soloing type of things because to make that work and to make it feasible and to be efficient enough 
to climb quickly and you know rope soil or cap in a day for example um then you have to pay attention to those small little details and i'm quite good at that i'm quite good at like making myself a procedure and a list of steps and things to follow and making sure things work out properly um so, and that's exactly the same as what i did with the with the rope soloing you know i didn't really know anything about it uh before i started but then i just read up on it uh i read up on all the sort of different techniques and then i applied that to i sort of like came up a little bit with my own systems and ways of doing it um from what i'd read and then i literally kind of just had this procedure of how i would do it and what i would do on each pitch of climbing to make sure that you know it ran smoothly and like the quickest way of doing things and you know how was i going to cuddle the rope in the bag and which point of the rope would i tie the knots in and where would i have the jumars on my harness to be you know quickest accessible and would i leave my shoes at the top or the bottom or you know all this kind of stuff and which piece of gear to clean and um yeah all that kind of stuff like i just went through all the nuances of it um so i had it kind of all mapped out uh, and that was exactly the same with uh climbing el cap like i had all the nuances of each pitch and each kind of pendulum and each traverse and yeah i like it mapped out especially when it's like as particular as as rope soloing like i guess yeah did you find that in that particular instance that pre-planning kind of went as planned or is some there was some problem problem solving on the fly happening up there uh oh, i was definitely always problem solving yeah I, like um i've said before that especially with rope soloing uh i would say i've done my most stupid mistakes uh like i've done some of my worst climbing and worst mistakes whilst rope soloing but i've also done some of my best climbing and, and best things within rope soloing um and also because you by yourself when you're doing these things you have to make all the decisions uh, so there's nobody to discuss these things with so you have to overcome all the problems um and yeah for sure when i was starting out there was like some there's some big old problems going on uh but yeah you just you just like you just make sure that those problems don't go into you know the red zone or the dangerous zone and you make sure that you sort those problems before it gets to that point uh and you make sure you sort them so it doesn't happen again or if it does happen again it's it's not as much of a problem you know um yeah. It, it sounds like that links really well with we're talking about being quite particular and want, wanting to be very organized the self-sufficiency of that seems to link in really well organized that was the word <laughs> that was the word i was looking for yeah yeah and then you spoke about you know maybe doing some of your best climbing some of your worst climbing in the same uh frame of of reference is that something that gives you kind of emotional highs and lows or are you pretty flat about that when you're on the wall mm, i think um Nah, definitely, definitely after you like, I wouldn't say some of my, my worst climbing, I think some of my worst maybe mistakes or, or things that I like, I feel like if maybe a partner was there, then I wouldn't have made that decision, for example. Um, and sometimes after those decisions, then you, you kind of are like, oh, I never, what, what am I doing? Like, I don't want to be doing this again. No, I was just like, freaking stupid. Like, why, why am I up here by myself doing this and making these stupid mistakes? Um, but then, like, like, after a while, and then you come down and you think about it and you think, like, why it happened and how you're not going to do it again, uh, then it suddenly, like, seems all fine again and then you want to go and solo a route again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah because i i definitely have come off some um uh solo climbs and thought like oh i don't want to be doing that anymore like it just seems like that was yeah that just wasn't good <laughs> i think yeah. uh regardless of the domain that you're in high performers really often have a, a pretty short memory in terms of you know <laughs> how how things affected us in the moment and then after the fact <laughs> yeah maybe yeah I think we touched on it a lot during the start of this conversation, but what kind of mindset do you approach, do you approach life with, do you approach performance with? 
Uh, how would you describe that? Mm, yeah, mindset. I, I think in general, like I'm, I'm a reasonably positive person in, in the things that I do. I'd say I generally go into things with pretty positive attitude. Um, uh, I'm quite like a... Mm, quite like it maybe an introverted person a little bit I would say um so I do like to do things by myself um obviously I like to do things with other people as well um but yeah I would I, I can't remember what the question was now oh we're just chatting question. about you about your mindset and uh oh, and mindset that was do you equate positivity with optimism or is that something that's different for you um I think I'm more of a realistic person rather than like over optimistic uh because I, f- I feel like i i know what is possible and what's not possible um yeah i would say more realistic than optimistic <laughs> yeah yeah Pos- positive and realistic we'll, we'll go with that do you, do you think there's any benefits of that realism? Is there some real benefits that you see from that? Mm, yeah, I think so, because it, it kind of, I feel like it tells me what isn't, isn't possible. I mean, may, maybe, I mean, I guess you could be under realistic and you might end up missing something that you could potentially do. If you were more of like the totally optimistic person, uh, but I feel like it's it's done me well so far. I, I also, I sort of like to make realistic decisions on um, sort of like danger and risk as well, because um, obviously I don't want like a mistake to be so bad that it ends up like catastrophic, you know. Um, so I like to be kind of level-headed and realistic in that approach, um, which I think is a, a good thing. Obviously, it's like when you're in the mountains or climbing these big walls, you can never take away all the risk. But what I like to do is try and minimize that risk as, as much as possible. So I'm not making you know, ridiculous decisions. I'm making realistic decisions, basically, up, upon my ability. Let's yeah. let's chat about that. Do you have a framework that you conceptualize risk by? Is there a way that you like to think about that or a way that you like to make those kind of risk-based decisions? Especially when you're thinking, you know, making those decisions in the fly in the Alpine are very different to making those decisions before short uh, head points, for example. Yeah, I, I think it's down to um, knowing your own ability um and knowing the environment that you're climbing in um and sort of like yeah matching up the two basically into what you're able to do so if we if we take for example like uh climbing a the big wall then i would say my ability to you know, i've been climbing big walls for what like six or seven eight years or whatever it is and i'd say my my knowledge and ability is reasonable in that sort of like skill now. And I sort of, uh, I feel like I know the environment and I feel like I know my ability so I can match those two up and take the appropriate action. Uh, whereas if I think about something like, um, more like mountain alpine climbing, uh, with snow and skiing, uh, an avalanche risk and all this kind of stuff like i've done a little bit of that uh and i've probably spent about three seasons doing that type of stuff uh, and i would say my ability is good in that um maybe not my skiing <laughs> but but <laughs> but but my ability in sort of um you know using axes and climbing and that kind of stuff is it, okay i feel sort of confident in that but my my knowledge and ability in the alpine environment i would say is not quite as good so i would say you know i'm not quite as prepared to 
monitor things and you know take what could be considered as as bigger risks in in a way i've kind of been relying a little bit more on partners to make those decisions for me uh, whereas in an environment that i understand and know i feel like i can make the decision um for me for myself and for my partner and feel like it's the right decision if that makes sense i don't know if that made any sense but yeah yeah, that makes so it makes sense. So to summarize, you're kind of talking about an interaction between your own capabilities and the environmental uh, aspects that are going on. And when you have yeah. a, you know, maybe a higher personal capability and a higher understanding of the environment and the potential hazards, then it's easier um, to make that call rationally, given you've got a lot of information uh, to make yeah, that decision certainly. based on. Yeah. Whereas when yeah. one of those areas is maybe a little bit lower on that scale, um, you tend to like to rely on you know partners for that decision or other yeah. factors yeah yeah and i think i think also um uh people uh i think there's a big difference between um something dangerous and something uh, risky um so like like the danger is uh like for example let's say uh, free for me free soloing a uh, a 510 uh, that's a very dangerous activity to be doing but i don't see it as um, particularly risky because i know i can climb 510 you know every single time obviously there is still an amount of risk but the risk is much smaller uh, whereas i feel like there could be more uh risk in somebody you know like a novice climber for example setting off on their first trad route and they've set off on a route which is kind of like a bit closer to their limit uh and maybe the danger doesn't seem quite as high because there's lots of gear to place and all this kind of stuff but the risk is actually quite high because they've never placed any gear and they're actually quite close to their limit and they could make a bad mistake. Uh, so one of them, the danger is actually quite low, but the risk is high. And one of them, the danger is high, but the risk is low. Uh, and I think, I think risk is the thing that actually is the bad thing. You know, that's, that's what's going to like end up killing you or really badly injuring you or that kind of stuff. It's not, yeah, it's like the risk you take, um, yeah, high danger and high risk. That's not what you want. <laughs> yeah, if you've got high danger, you want low risk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I've heard um, maybe Dave McLeod or Alex Hall describe it as risk versus consequence, and it seems to be a very similar thing to what, you, what you're describing, with the risk being the percentage chance maybe of something happening, and the consequence, yeah. or in your in your words, the danger, uh, being yeah. how, how bad that thing happening could could be. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. What about um, psychological strategies or tools? Obviously, uh, when you're up there on these big walls, when you're headpointing shorter routes, even your you're headpoint climbing and your bouldering, are there any psychological or mental strategies or tools that you have in your toolkit and you like to implement or apply? Mm, I think I think it's um, it's preparation. So it's sort of like being. Uh, is believing and knowing that I am prepared for what I'm actually doing, and that gives me confidence in what I'm doing. Um, it's it's definitely like I think with any of these things, which are quite like big goals, you know, a hard head point, a big like a, a big wall or whatever. It's um, uh, it is being like confident within yourself. Like you definitely have to go into these things with confidence. There's no point in like tapping around at the bottom, like, oh, should, you know, should, should I be going? Should I not? It's like, it's like, I'm going and I'm going to do this well. And yeah, like you go into it with confidence and climbing well, and you know, you're going to do it. Like, I think that's definitely one thing that I try and take into these things. Um, uh, another thing, like I always try and pull from like past experiences, I guess. Uh, so I feel like, I've obviously done a lot of climbing up to that point. Um, and sometimes it can feel 
like overwhelming if you're just about to start a start a really hard route or really big wall or whatever it might be um yeah and the whole thing can think like oh my god you know can i can i even climb anymore um but i like in those moments i think i like pull from past experience and like oh no you have done this before you've you know you've done this you climbed well here you've managed to keep it together in this situation um and i think i just like draw draw on those things to make me climb well and feel confident um it's definitely all about confidence with with these things uh, but again it's the same thing like you've got to be able to match your your confidence with your ability like if you're overconfident for your ability then you're going to end up in a in a bad situation i think uh whereas if your confidence and ability match each other then you'll be able to make the the right decisions i think to tie those together it really seems like those previous experiences uh build up your confidence and that's something that you really draw upon uh kind of in the moment or before big moments is there a is there a structure for that happening is that through your own internal self-talk uh do you like to kind of recall memories i'm not sure i'd maybe i wouldn't actually recall i can't think of anything in particular maybe i wouldn't recall memories but it's more of just like a internal thing of knowing that i've done it before for it for an example um yeah <laughs> i'm not sure actually and there seemed like there was kind of a language thing in there with how you talk to yourself about these objectives you were you know talk uh you were kind of speaking to how you talk to yourself before you set off uh, for example, and reminding yourself, like, you've done this before, it's within your capabilities, here are these other experiences that, you know, lead you to believe that. Um, but that sounds like a very, like, a declarative way of talking to yourself, right? Like, uh, you, you are going to do this, you have done this, or is there, is there more, um, not necessarily doubt, but more ambiguity in that? How, how does that, how's that language and the words you use look there? Um... I don't think there's, I, I mean, there definitely is a little bit of doubt um, whenever you do these things, but that's what, like, that's what you don't want. You don't want too much doubt <laughs> because if you have too much doubt, then uh, I always feel you're not going to climb to your potential. And if you're not going to climb to potential, then you, you're going to start making mistakes. So, I mean, that's, that's why I sort of like, I guess would, you know, pull on those best experiences um or, or even things that have gone wrong and you've sort of overcome them like these are the things that you kind of tell yourself that you that you can do it in in a way um uh but i'm not sure there's like any there's not really like any dialogue in a way of like Oh, remember that that time on that route when that was happening. Like, I'm not really. It's it's not really it's not really like that. <laughs> I think it's it's really interesting when you speak about how you like to remind yourself for uh, that you've overcome challenges in the past. I think that ties in real really well with the realism we we're chatting about uh, in terms of mindset, because reminding yourself, you know, we we talk about this all the time with visualization, especially with. Uh, you know how to effectively visualize we often think about using visualization as like this perfect world where everything goes well and increasingly it's becoming apparent at least on the research side that visualizing in a more realistic way where yeah you feel pretty scared when you're above the last piece of gear and your heart rate starts to rise and you use the tools you've got to grapple with that and succeed is a more effective way to you know forecast that situation because it allows you to grapple with the challenges ahead of time uh, and it sounds is, like is, your approach really aligns with that. Yeah, is that what, um, is that like some research? Is that what research is? Yeah, that's kind of what it's been suggested right now with um, okay. visualizing, at least on the sports psychology side, being able to visualize, yeah. you know, not necessarily a perfect situation, but a successful outcome, regardless of what's going on around you. So like, yeah. hey, I'm going to feel the exposure when I step over and, you know, I'm going to set on my heart rate, I'm going to focus on what I can control, I'm going to execute. Yeah. Um, seems to be a way more powerful way of viewing that image than simply going, ah, oh, you know, what that other stuff isn't going to be there, even though it always it always is. Mm. No, that's, that's really interesting actually, because um, 
uh, that's definitely how I visualize stuff, especially uh, climbing. I know I keep going back to big walls, but it seems like the, the obvious thing to talk about. Um, like when you are going to climb these these big walls by yourself, you know, with a mixture of rope sole and free sole, whatever it might be. Um, like that is definitely how I visualize stuff. I'll actually, I'll actually start by visualizing the basically things that could go wrong, like, like everything from the worst situation to like, you know, actually like falling off, like actually sort of visualize that, um, and how hideous that might be. Uh, but then I'll, I'll start at that end point and then I'll work through all the little bits, um, below that. So, you know, it might be like, you were just saying like, oh, the exposure going over here or whatever, and being able to, you know, visualizing what that actually might feel like. Um, and all, you know, or maybe there's, there's a wet hold there and visualizing what that might feel like and how you're going to overcome that situation when you're not, you didn't expect it to be there. And I sort of go through all these things, um, and all the things that could go wrong and I actually visualize them all going wrong and then visualize overcoming them, uh, until you have like a, a really ugly ascent and then you've visualized it all the way down, getting out all the problems and then visualizing a kind of perfect ascent at the end. That's kind of how, how, it, how my stage goes. <laughs> yeah. So I think that really ties together. You chatted about preparation and then confidence as the two main psychological strategies that you might use. I think that ties the two together really well. You must gain a lot of confidence from knowing that you can problem solve like that and having that, you know, feeling of overcoming those challenges maybe before they happen. So when you're on the wall and things are going either better than you expected or about as, about as you visualized, at least you've, uh, you've kind of grappled with that a little bit. Yeah. 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 And I think, uh, it's a good point actually saying like, uh, uh, it visualized things uh, or things really, when you're on the wall, things are going better, expect better than expected. I think it's also kind of important to, uh, sometimes actually visualize that feeling as well before you get on, because you don't want the overcom you don't want to be, be like overconfident as well in those, in those situations, uh, some, or like in those serious situations, you want to be like, like level-headed and get the job done until you can be overconfident about it you know until it's over basically yeah. yeah yeah almost making use of that like emotive aspect of uh previewing or preparation to stop yourself kind of getting carried away when the moment does come yeah uh, we yeah, see that no, all totally. the time in hard sport climbing right it's like you get through the crooks and you're on the like red points you yeah. know jokes yeah, yeah, to the yeah. finish and you're like <laughs> yeah. holy yeah. crap I've, I've done it i don't don't blow it don't i've done it yeah no totally yeah 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 yeah. What about habits and routines, Pete? So, I mean, you seem like you lead kind of a really structured life. You're really organized in how you go about stuff. Are there any habits and routines that have been a, a real game changer in terms of performance or, or wellness over the years? Mm, I don't, I'm not much of a, I sound really like quite organized and stuff, don't I? But I'm not much of a, a, a routine person, but when I'm more of the person like, when stuff needs doing, I'll do it. Like I'll get it done. <laughs> I'm, more, I'm more of like that sort of person, but I, I'm not sure. Like, I mean, that's definitely a habit. Like, you know, I like to get it done, uh, get it done and do a good job of it. Um, but in terms of actual like routines in life, I don't really like, uh, f yeah, I definitely don't really like follow routines, which is quite odd because when I, when I'm talking now, I sound like a real structured and organized person you'd think i'd like be up at half seven and like have my teeth brushed by quarter past and, you know all this kind of stuff but i'm just not at all <laughs> that's yeah that's a really interesting contrast i mean i must provide i think it'd be tough to be that organized in all aspects of your life yeah yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's maybe that's the thing i sort of like to focus that routine and attention on those climbing aspects and then uh and I guess like business aspects as well. And then in my other side of life, I guess it's maybe like, oh, I'm more like re relaxing in a way. So I'm not in that routine situation or like trying to 
get stuff done or whatever and it's just like oh i can relax <laughs> it <laughs> provides that. provides yeah. like a contrast or a balance or yeah. a release from yeah, it maybe yeah 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 that's it's, uh, it's, it's super it's, interesting it's, it's, yeah it's sort of like with my um uh my climbing training actually like i'm not massively structured with my climbing training uh but i mean i follow the same thing of like i like to get it done and i like to do a good job but i'm not massively routine about it you know um i just generally go on like how i feel and like what i want to do and if i want to have a massive session like i'll have a massive session and <laughs> and i'll get it done <laughs> and if i don't then uh, i won't <laughs> yeah do you find that with your training, you you often kind of get it done regardless of if the day's dragging on a little bit or you have to squeeze it in? Or is it more of a case of other things taking priority and maybe you drop the ball for that day and you pick it up the next day? Mm, it's it's more of like um, if I want to do it, actually, rather than... Uh, so so if, if, if I don't want to do it on a particular day, then... I won't do it but if i feel motivated to do three sessions in a day and like train until two in the morning then then i'll do it <laughs> yeah, yeah where does that motivation come from or, or not come from mm, uh, it could be just because i have lots of energy uh it could be because uh i didn't train on another day so then I like, I want to train. <laughs> uh, it could be because I have uh, like a big goal or project in mind. I mean, that's definitely when I get most motivated. Um, I mean, generally with my training, I tend to like just tick along and keep it ticking over. And then when I have a big goal or a big objective, then I'll be like, then I'll get that motivation. I'll find that motivation because I have something in mind. And then I'll like smash, smash the training. <laughs> so really yeah. like an interaction of listening to your mind and then listening to your body so if you're feeling really high energy maybe have a bigger day or if you're also feeling like super psyched on an upcoming project uh kind of taking that rational that rational view i think so yeah 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 i think i've um in the past of uh in my early 20s i sort of I went the wrong way with with it a little bit and i ended up just going from one thing to the next and just like always wanting to like smash the training uh and then actually getting a little bit demotivated by it all uh and actually like making myself ill you know um so i think it's good to like roll with it when you have the motivation but just like you know chill out a little bit keep ticking over obviously uh so you're ready to ready to go when it matters and you've been more conscious of that as your career's dragged on or, or gone on a little bit uh yeah i think so yeah 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 is there anyone that you've been particularly inspired by along the way and then what have you learned from them if so mm -hmm. no i'm generally i guess i'm generally inspired by the people that i've climbed with i think um so back in my uh late mid late teens uh, i started climbing with somebody called ben cossey from uh, Australia and he came over to the UK and you know at the time I was at a certain point in my climbing and he was at like this like you know a, definitely a number of levels way above me um, and sort of like watching him climb and climbing with him sort of inspired me to be able to push my own climbing within that style um, and then obviously in later years I've climbed with uh, Tom a lot so that's you know that's always been inspiring because he's pushed me you know he's made me push my climbing um in a certain way and uh yeah i think it's yeah it's those those sorts of people recently i've uh, done a little bit more climbing with um matt helica who's like a an alpinist um and again he's got like this knowledge and experience in that kind of alpine environment which i don't have and so, you know, he's in, kind of inspired me in that way. Um, I think it's just, yeah, for me, it's just the people that I climb with. It's not necessarily like one person that I've looked at and want to be because 
I don't want to be somebody else, you know. <laughs> yeah. Have you found yourself um, like seeking out these kind of mentorship um, partnerships or has that been something that's come really naturally? No, I definitely haven't seek them out at all. It's, uh, it's purely uh, something that has come, yeah, naturally. Um, yeah, I mean, Ben, it just, yeah, it's just like I just happened to meet these people, you know, and then I ended up climbing with them. And um, I mean, you end up climbing with these people because of the friendships, I think. And just having a good time with them, you know, all these people like Ben, Tom, Matt, these people uh, that I've climbed with for the last 10, 15 years or whatever. I've just had a good relationship at the time with them. Uh, and I think that's what the, the important thing is. Yeah. And I'm sure they're drawn to your kind of willingness to learn and the energy you bring uh, coming back into that friendship or that partnership. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, I think, I think so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully it works both ways, yeah. <laughs> Have you received any really great advice along the way? I can't think of any particular advice, but I mean, I've definitely learned a lot from these, from these people. I mean, with, with, with Ben, definitely. I mean, I went from uh, climbing E3 uh, to within one year uh, climbing or establishing E9. Um, and I think with Ben, he probably, I think he just showed me that these things are possible, you know, like I had the ability to do these things. And I think he showed me that, you know, they, these things are possible to do because before I didn't really, these routes seemed way out of my league when actually, you know, potentially they actually weren't. So I think he showed me that they were possible. Um, I think with, uh, with Tom, it's definitely been about like, goal setting and uh determination and motivation and i think just pushing each other i mean we both have those characteristics anyway but i think i mean maybe tom's brought that even out of me a little bit more um and i guess i kind of like look up to him with other stuff that he's doing in life as well you know aside from climbing and um yeah, he's always he's always good. I'm always asking him questions about stuff and <laughs> yeah, trying to, trying to uh, uh, yeah, not not make any stupid mistakes. Um, <laughs> and then uh, I guess with with Matt, it's uh, like he has lots of knowledge in that environment that I don't know about. So he's constantly like feeding me all this new information, um, which. I did, yeah, he's like really knowledgeable, all that kind of stuff, and I don't really know. So it always feels like every time I go, like mountain climbing or uh, winter climbing with him, I always feel like I learn something. Whether it's you know really simple things like to start with how to put the crampons on, you know, or like how to put the axe on your bag, to maybe more uh, more things now about like the environment and the snow and avalanches and winter belays you know all, all this kind of stuff so yeah well thank you for sharing those with us it sounds like uh you know we're a product of the people around us right and that's definitely been the case in in, in your career too yeah no yeah definitely definitely i mean you can always learn something off somebody can't you so absolutely yeah. <laughs> yeah if you were to offer yourself any you know if you think back five years ago 10 years ago maybe even 15 years um if you were to offer your younger self any advice would there be anything in particular that you you pass down Ooh, um, mm, I think it's just like take opportunities, you know, I think that's a, that's definitely something that you should do. <laughs> take, take, take opportunities because may, maybe they just don't lead anywhere, but you know, if you don't take any opportunities, they, you won't, you won't go anywhere in a way you've got to take those opportunities. So. Yeah, I always try and take take opportunities. So that's what I tell myself. Keep taking them. Yeah. yeah, I think when we have this conversation, it all sounds so serendipitous, right? But really, that's a product of conscious decisions you've made to step to the edge of your comfort zone and and take on projects or trips or plans that maybe, like you said, seem unrealistic on day one, and then by day you know six hundred and sixty, six hundred seventy, yeah. feel, feel a little <laughs> yeah. bit more like oh, we can actually get this done. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah, yeah. 
what does the future look like for you, Pete? Obviously, you've got you've got your book out. You're doing all your stuff with with Wide Boys. Uh, do you have any projects coming up, either uh, climbing, personal, professional, um, and anything you you're really looking forward to? Yeah, I definitely um, I definitely have projects. I've got um, I do have climbing projects. Uh, generally, uh, or these days, or in the last few few years, I've, I've generally had uh, sort of like one big project or one kind of big wall project which I'm kind of psyched about and then one kind of harder route single pitch type thing which I've been psyched about um and I kind of have the the same thing now in terms of climbing um so I have like a big wall plan and a, a smaller harder type route kind of plan um and then for things aside from climbing uh I guess the last couple of years I have been focused on just trying to build up the the wide boys business okay I'm, yeah i'm just kind of keen to bring crack climbing to people uh and be able to get uh like new people into crack climbing and be able to you know show them techniques and teach them things and uh just bring crack climbing into the the kind of the sport not just as a, a trad climbing or outdoor element but bring it to people who are just starting out climbing and at the indoor walls and because i think it's a really interesting style of climbing which you know anybody can enjoy um so i want i want other people to be able to enjoy it <laughs> i'm always really impressed by how you folks make it so accessible to get into something that's you know often seen as kind of grueling or painful or intimidating for a lot of climbers i think um you know i think you guys do a really good job of making it super accessible and getting people really excited about learning some new skills and like you said a style of climbing that is really interesting yeah no definitely yeah 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 what does your support system look like on on both a personal and commercial level kind of who do you have around you who's in your corner who's um who's really helping you out there uh you mean in terms of sponsors or in terms of uh both let's go let's go kind of personal and then spon sponsors too um well i guess in like a, on a personal level i have uh my girlfriend um, Mari and my parents as well. Uh, they, my parents have always been like really supportive of, of things that I do. They've never really said like, oh, you shouldn't be, you know, on that path or you shouldn't be on this path. You know, they've always kind of, yeah, they've been very, they haven't really questioned anything, <laughs> you know, that I've, that I've kind of done. Uh, so they've always been supportive in that. Um, uh, and yeah, like I say, Mari is supportive in all the things that I do at, at the moment. Um, and then obviously, yeah, like my, my kind of my best and main friends around me. It's kind of like with anybody, you know, family and friends are going to be there to support you. So they definitely are. And then in terms of um, uh, other support, like I get support from sponsors. So I'm sponsored by uh, Patagonia and Wild Country and uh, Unparallel and uh, Sterling Ropes. Uh, so a lot of those guys... You know, Sterling Roots, Patagonia, Wild Country, I've been with for 10 plus years. Uh, so they've been like a massive support to, to my climbing throughout that time. Um, Unparalleled is like a new sponsor, but they've been, you know, really good for the for the first four months that I've been with them. So, yeah. Yeah. Or I'm always very thankful of my sponsors. So, yeah, they've been a big support. I'll put links to all of those folks in the description so people can check them out uh, and go and view all their stuff. And, uh, yeah, maybe this is like an embarrassing admission. I've shown the video of your mom belaying you when you rock over oh, on yeah. that heel hook so many times. <laughs> um, I actually use it as part of a, a part of a section of a workshop about self talk, uh, and I use it with non climbers a lot because uh, you rock over right, and then you have like top rope, top rope. I'm on top rope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I always link it into when I'm talking about how we can use mantras to support ourselves and you know remind ourselves of crucial information. Uh, I always kind of link those together. And every time I show it non-climbers, they think it's nuts, especially when yeah. I point out that it's your mom on the belay. And they're like, this is crazy. <laughs> yeah. That's what I mean. You're just supportive, you know, supportive what I was doing. I'm not sure if it was, yeah, I don't know. It's quite funny when I look back at that now. Yeah, that must be, uh, yeah. I mean, I, that must be such an old video now, especially if you look back on. Uh, but I'm, great, yeah, I'm yeah, grateful it's like that it's around. 13 years ago. Yeah, 13 years ago or something. So, yeah. <laughs> Hey, thank you again for your time today, Pete. I really appreciate having a chance to chat about this stuff with you, and uh, I can't wait for people to to start to learn some of this stuff from you. Is there any is there a number one takeaway or a final bit of advice you have for our audience? 
Um, I don't think so, but uh, I just want to say that was a really interesting interview. So thanks very much. Like so, so much more interesting than a lot of interviews that I've done. So that was really, really good. It made me think. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, so cheers, man. Oh, I really appreciate hearing that. I, I love talking about stuff and I, I really love hearing the parallels to high performance athletes in different domains of, you know, various outdoor sports can draw to what we'd say academically is best practice. I think yeah. that uh, reinforces what we do on the academic side and also reinforces how elite performers will find a successful way to do things, even if they've not necessarily been reading the research or consulting with a sports psychologist. It's more trial and error. This is what works. And then it gets kind of backed up empirically. And I, I love hearing yeah. those parallels. I think that's fascinating. So I, I really yeah. appreciate your time. Yeah, cool. No, thank you very much. Where can people connect with you? Where can they follow along? Where can they get involved with Wide Boy stuff? Where can they buy your book? Learn a little bit more about crack climbing. What's the what's the deal there? Yeah, so um, for the business side of things with Wide Boys, you can follow us on kind of uh, the social media platforms. Uh, we're just like Wide underscore Boys <laughs> on on all the social media platforms, uh, and the YouTube channel. We're just Wide Boys as well. Um, and then in terms of um, my crack climbing book. You can get that from somebody called Vertebrate Publishing. So uh, if you're in the UK, Europe, or what we'd call classes like rest of the world, then it's Vertebrate Publishing. If you're in uh, Canada or America, then it's uh, Mountain Books. Uh, so they publish it over there. And then for, uh, as a personal like um, social media, it's just, yeah, Pete Whitaker, zero, one. <laughs> yeah, so if anyone wants to find me, I'm, I'm on there. Yeah. I'll be sure again to stick all those links in the description and people can people can check them out but yeah thank you again so much Pete this has been a blast chatting about this stuff with you and uh, I really appreciate your time good luck with the summer projects be that kind of on, on the bigger walls or the single pitches I know you mentioned you're, yeah. you're in Norway for the summer so hopefully you've got some big stuff planned yeah no yeah, thank you yeah cheers thanks for joining me for that conversation with Pete Whittaker I loved how Pete broke down intimidating concepts like risk and consequence and the lessons that he shared from multiple decades of hard rock climbing. As always, if you enjoyed this content and want to see more like it, then please take your time to share it with a friend or partner who might find it interesting, and subscribe wherever you're joining us from. I've been Andre Manzouk, and this has been Mountain Mindset. Until next time.